Okay, as they're walking off the stage, I have a question for you to think about. It's a, it's a really deep, uh, complicated question and philosophical. The question is, have you ever been busted? <laughs> have you ever been busted for something like it was so clear that you did it that, that you couldn't even argue with it? You were caught red-handed. You were guilty as sin uh, of your sin, and, and you couldn't even deny it. You're just standing there, and you were busted. Uh, I have... I have raised four sons, and, and, and by the way, they've all been busted for something, and uh, usually it's the second half of their senior year. If you're raising sons, it's going to go well the first three and a half years of high school. That, that last year, the wheels come off. Anyway, gr- girls in high school, I have no idea. Anyway, so I have one son that gets busted. He's just finished high school, and he and his friends, it's, it's the end of their senior year, and it's summer in Arizona. There's not a lot to do, so they're out playing basketball in June till almost midnight on an outdoor court not far from here. And at midnight, they're finally done, tired of playing, and so they start walking to a friend's house, and then one of the guys said, hey, wouldn't it, sure wouldn't it feel good to jump into a swimming pool right now? And the other guys, they all go, yeah, that would sure feel good. And so then one says, hey, how about we just jump in uh, a pool that, you know, as we walk back? And they don't know whose house it is, but they go and look over a fence and they see a pool. So they climb the wall, jump over into someone's yard, and they, they go swimming. And, and they jump out and run down the street. And then about four or five houses down the road, they jump into another yard and into another pool. And then they do this another Another time, jump into a third house's pool and go swimming, and then they run down the street, and they're, then they're walking, and then a police officer pulls up at this point. And the police officer rolls down his window and says, we have reports of serial pool jumping, and uh, a number of houses are reporting this. And he asks them, so do you know anything about this? And they're standing there, soaking wet, head to toe. They jumped in in their shorts, their sneakers, there's water coming out of their sneakers and water coming off their hair and and their their basketball shorts are down to here, it was soaking wet. What do you say to that? Officer, I don't know what you're talking about. I have no idea. (laughs) Hey, do you know what happens next? It's called criminal trespassing, actually, and you stand in front of a judge for that. That's what happens. The nice neighbors then press charges, so it all ended up fine. My point is, we've all been busted like that, haven't we? At some point in your life, you get, and you're just left standing there. You can't even deny it. And it goes back. Well, as you heard Matthew and Byron just now talk about, talk about we're going through this series, Via Dolorosa, and life-changing encounters that Jesus has on the way to the cross. We looked at John 1 last week, and then this morning we looked at, uh, briefly at John 3 and John 4. Open your Bibles to John 8. And we come to a store, an encounter that Jesus has with a woman who really is busted and has no excuses at all. Verse 3, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? We read they're trying to trap him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let the one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and started to write in the ground. And so we have a group of men find this woman guilty as sin of her sin, and they bring her to Jesus, and they have rocks in their hands, and they're about to stone her. This morning, I want to call them rock collectors, for lack of a better word. And some people go through that, collecting rocks to throw at people. But they bring her to Jesus, not for healing, like people usually did, but they bring her to Jesus for killing. And these stone throwers are standing there with the rocks because they found her guilty of her sin. Now, here's the thing. I imagine that, uh, first of all, we believe that she was married because it says she's committing adultery. So we, we probably can know that she was married and the man was probably married why the man isn't standing there also about to be stoned, maybe that's a whole other sermon. But I imagine that early on this all started rather innocently. Maybe they met each other in the break room at work, and then the conversations just got a, lo- a bit longer and longer each lunch break. 
And then after those long conversations, then one of them started to text, and they started to text back and forth until the text got a little too saucy. And then uh, one of them left their hand on the other's shoulder longer than they should have at work, or she left her hand on his arm just a little bit longer than she should have. And then they crossed the line. And isn't it true that when you cross the line once, you cross it a dozen more times? And now there's the spiral of lies and denials and deleting texts and deleting emails and making up stories and trying to hide the truth. But now she's been caught. Now she's busted. She can't deny a thing. You know, you know if this was you, you would give anything in the world to go back and undo those bad decisions. But now you're standing there and there's stoners in front of you about to throw rocks at your head. And this is all happening publicly, we read, in front of everyone who is listening to Jesus. You know, the shame feels maybe worse than the stones that are about to hit her body. And uh, she's standing there in front of Jesus. And so what do you, what do, you do now? When, when you look at this story at the beginning of this, we read the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. These are the ones with stones in their hands. These are the stoners. I don't know about you, but when I grew up in high school, we had quite a few stoners in my school. You have stoners. I never did like the stoners. Can I see some hands here? A few of you had? Okay, no, no, the stoners. We know who we're talking about. The stoners were always up to no good. And I don't think Jesus liked them so much either. He never did seem to like these kinds of people. But but he, when you read this passage, you see that, that it's the Pharisees and the, the teachers of the law. These are the most religious. And isn't it ironic that the most religious 2,000 years ago were also the most judgmental, the most angry, the most cynical and critical, uh, the, the most angry, the most hypocritical and self-righteous. That was 2,000 years ago. But as I, I was thinking about this passage and I was thinking about my own growing up years in church, I'm not talking about years, maybe years was different, but to me, when I was younger growing up in church, it seemed like the most religious in church were also the most judgmental, the most angry, the most unhappy, the most self-righteous, the most hypocritical. That was 2,000 years later. So doesn't it seem like some churches have a way of breeding and producing rock collectors? And these rock collectors, they go through church and their Christian life with stones they're ready to throw at people. And they, see, they say things like, their kids are out of control. They jump over walls at midnight and go swimming in people's pool. <laughs> they say things like that. They say, have you seen their marriage? It's in trouble. Or they say, she's so carnal. Or, or he's so shallow, he's not deep. Or do you know what he does when no one's around? They say those things like that. Here's the thing. In general, I don't think I'm a big fan of collectors. Just coll I, be, Only because I think collectors are like borderline hoarders. It, it seems like it's one and the same. And maybe you're a collector and you're not a hoarder. I don't know what the difference is. But I see, I see them on the TV shows and people go to the collectors or the hoarders' homes and they try to buy their things. And, and, and for example, one guy might have a barn full of superhero lunch boxes, like a thousand of them. And they'll try to buy one. He goes, no, that's my favorite one. They're all his favorite. And his family's saying, please sell it. Please. He's got, he has containers, shipping containers and trailers full of junk because collectors tend to hold on to things tightly. They don't want to let go. Have you noticed how some people collect stones that they want to throw at people? They collect judges. I mean, they collect grudges and they collect anger and judgmental attitudes. They collect bitterness. Some people go through life like that. If I ask you this morning, do you know anyone who's been carrying a stone around in their hand? Or how about this? Is there a stone that you've been holding on to in your hand, wishing you had a chance to throw it at someone? I think it's very possible to go through life filling it with the stones that we carry. And the stones all say something different. Uh, this one says revenge. 
this one says, shame. We try to shame people because they shamed us in a meeting and disagreed with us. This one is anger. We can hold on to anger for a long time. I'm going to get back at you. Uh, this one says, race. Some people carry around racism in their heart. Uh, and, and we can walk. I've got stones all over the stage here. This one is envy. I want what they have. So this one is jealousy and unforgiveness. You know, we, this next one says grudge on it. I, there was a man last night who said he dropped his stone and he wrote grudge on it because he's been carrying a, around a grudge against his brother for 60 years. This one says hate, resentment, anger. And this backpack gets really heavy. And some people go through life like that, always looking for a stone to throw at somebody. And, and, and we carry around all of these feelings, and life gets extremely weighted, doesn't it? But the thing is, the human heart, the human soul, was never meant to be a container of anger and hatred and resentment and revenge. We're not wired that way. We don't do well when we have to carry around a load like this. And so do you know what Jesus says? He comes along and he says, if your life feels really burdened and heavy, then give it to me and let me lighten your load. And he wants to take it off of your shoulder just like that. Today, I want you, as we start talking, to keep asking yourself this question. Have you ever held a stone in your hand? Let's go back to our text in John chapter 8. And because G they bring this woman in front of Jesus, and then he does something so interesting, kind of strange. Verse 6, Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And you want to interrupt him and say, hey, Jesus, this is serious now. This lady's about to die, and now you're, you're, you're doodling on the ground like you're on a conference call that's boring you. You know, what's, what's happening here? Could you pay attention? And we read that they start to harass him, almost badger him. Verse 7, they kept on questioning him. So he straightens up, and he looks at them. And then he says something that at first glance, it seems like, Jesus, why would you say this? He says it in so many words. He says, go ahead and throw the stones on one condition. He says, I have one condition. You can throw the stones. Go ahead. But he says this, verse 7, let the one who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. So he says, you can do what you want to do. But on this one condition, let the sinless one among you throw the first stone. And they get silent. They freeze. They don't know what to do next because you know what they realize? They realize that they brought this woman in front of him because of her sin. And Jesus flips the script and he says, you are a sinner too. All of us are sinners. So why would you want to stone her when you have your own sin? Here's what uh, Paul says. Paul was a stone thrower in the Bible, formerly Saul. In the book of Romans, he's writing to the, the Christians in Rome, chapter 3. He says, for all have sinned, and all have fallen short of the glory of God. Verse 24, yet God with undeserved kindness declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sin. So they want to stone her, and then instead Jesus says, you are sinners too. Can't you see that? In fact, his message is we all have a sin problem. Here's how he says it in Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, Why are you worried about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own eye? He goes on to say, First, get rid of the speck in your eye. Uh, then you can see past uh, the log in your own eye. Hypocrite, first get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. And then go back to verse 8 in John chapter 8. And we read that he starts to write on the ground again. And, you know, for centuries... Uh, theologians have been wondering, what is it? You know, twice he goes down and he's writing on the ground. Some say, some theologians guess that he wrote the names of her accusers. He was just listing their names. Others will say they think that he wrote their names and then he wrote their sins next to their names. 
I personally, and I've shared this with some of you before, I think I'm, I'm cor- more correct than most of them. I think he wrote something like, uh, the first one of you that throws a stone at this beautiful Hebrew girl, I'm going to beat you down like you're in a cage fight, I, I, a UFC cage fight. I think that's just my conjecture. I don't know. It was something like that because when he stood up, we read that they had scattered. They were all gone. They didn't know what to say next. Verse 7, let the one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone. His point here is that every one of us has this sin problem, has something wrong on the inside. I have this key idea, and, and I hope this thought goes home with you today, that the grace of Jesus is limitless. He never stops extending this forgiveness and love to every person he encounters, including you and me. And we, too, are called to show this same grace and forgiveness and love to every person that he sends on our way. So Jesus here, I want you to see, he does not condone what she's done. He goes on and he says, we read in verse 10, Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are the ones who have accused you, condemned you? She says, no one. Then he says, neither do I condemn you. Now go and leave your life of sin. And so he tells her, you know, I, you are a sinner, but we're all sinners. And so he doesn't judge her for it, but he sets her free from it. I think this interaction, if there's anything that it should remind us of, it's the love of God. And, and you see that this woman, Jesus finally sees in her what the others don't see is that she is a child of God. And I want to remind you this morning that if this is you, if her story is some kind in some way your story, that there is nothing that you will ever do that will cause God to love you less. There's simply nothing that you will ever do, no sin you'll ever commit that will cause him to stop loving you. Yes, he wants us to to leave our life of sin, but there's nothing that you will ever do to make God love you less. So I've said that the old way of following God was to go through life as a, as a rock collector. I want to share with you a challenge to a new way of life that Jesus puts in front of us, and it's this, to become agents of grace and love. So I have the word agents up here, and I was really wrestling this week with what's the right word? Well, what are we of grace and love? And I, and I thought maybe we could use the word suppliers of grace and love or distributors of grace and love. Neither of those seem to work. Sharers of grace and love. How about, I tried dealers of grace and love, and Josh says, no, you can't use dealers. And so I, I landed on agent. I landed on agents, because when I was in high school, I don't know about you, but most guys in high school want to be an agent of some kind. I wanted to be a CIA agent, FBI agent, you know, double agent, you know, foreign international espionage agent, an MI5 agent, I want to be an agent. And now we can all be agents. And here, you are called to be an agent of grace and love. You see, following God before was, according to the Pharisees and uh, the Sadducees and the religious teachers, following God was a list of rules. And there was punishment waiting for you when you didn't follow those rules. And now Jesus comes along and says, following God is most about grace and love, and then sharing that with others. When I say this, I think about a girl who is at the Grove. Her name, what we'll say is Emily. I write about her in True Religion, my book, Taking Pieces of Heaven to Places of Hell on Earth. And and I share her story because Emily's story, in many ways, is the Grove story. I I had known her family for years, but, but then when she was in 11th grade, she started to hang out with the wrong crowd. And she started to go to parties on the weekends and there was a lot of drinking at the parties and so she would drink with her friends. And somewhere during her 11th grade year, a page turned and she just didn't drink at parties but now she needed the alcohol. She was slowly becoming an alcoholic and she started to hide alcohol under her bed in her closet. Her parents would find it and, and, and punish her and throw it away, but then she would find some more. Then she started to use recreational drugs with her friends. By her senior year, her parents had put her in rehab, but then she was out of rehab and back in rehab, and nothing seemed to be changing. Somehow, Emily finally graduated from high school, and I remember running into her just about a week or so after school got out that May. And, and she has, by the way, 
the brightest, most infectious smile of almost anyone that I know. She has a, this incredible perky spirit. And so I see her. So in spite of all her struggles, she has this big old smile when I see her. I said, Emily, how are you doing? She says, I'm doing okay. And I said, well, what are you doing this summer? She says, well, I don't have any plans this summer at all. And I said, well, then, Emily, you know what? We're leaving for Africa in two weeks. Why don't you come with us? And she was like, okay, I'll come. I'll, I'll come with you. I said, oh, all right. So that was it. You know, it was a pretty quick conversation. But as I started to share with some others, and other people heard that Emily was coming to Africa on a missions trip, then I had very concerned Christians come to talk to me. And, and uh, one person said, Palmer, do you know she has a lot of problems? You know, she has a very checkered past. And I said, I know. And then I had other people say, do you think with all of her problems she should be going to help other people? I don't. And I said, maybe this is the very reason she needs to go. I don't know what God will do. And so so with all of that encouraging feedback, uh, Emily got on the plane with us. And that summer, there were about 60 of us from the Grove that flew to Africa. And I ended up with Emily and her team in Malawi for about two weeks. And for two weeks, every day, I, I think it was every day, uh, she went to the same place. She went to Children of the Nation's Orphanage. And every day for two weeks, Emily held orphans. She found the little babies that didn't have mothers. She found the toddlers that didn't have anyone to tie their shoes or wipe their nose. And she gave them baths. She rocked them and held them till they fell asleep. She read them stories, put clean clothes on them, braided the girls' hair for two weeks. Every day, she just loved on them. And then we came back to Arizona. And you know what? As far as I know... She never took another drink again. I don't know what changed. I don't know what God did, but he changed her. That two weeks changed her, and she was free of the alcohol and the drug, drug use. By the way, that fall, she, she registered to go to a Christian college. She only lasted a semester because then she was back in Africa in Soweto. Then she came back to college, and then she left again to serve somewhere else, and then she came back to college. It took her about seven or eight years to finish college because she kept flying around the world, spreading and sharing the love of Jesus Christ. Do you see why I say her story? is the Grove story. Because we've always wanted this church to be a place where people can come with our problems, in spite of our problems, and experience the love and grace that Jesus Christ has for all of us. And then do you see how, how this one girl, when she is shown a, just a little bit of grace, just a little bit of love, then she goes and she pours that grace and love into the lives of others, and as she's doing it, she is changed. God does something in her. That's what this place is for. Some churches, it seems like you have to get your act together before you show up there. And I want you to know at the Grove, just come. And Jesus always said, come to my table, and then you can get your act together there. You come clean at the table, not before you get there. I have this, uh, if you're writing anything down this morning, I think one of my favorite things that Jesus came to do is to rebrand for lack of a better word, what it means to be a follower of God. Because Old Testament theology, following God meant redemptive violence. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they love redemptive violence. You make a mistake, you're going to pay a price. You know, you're going to get whipped, something like that, stoned, and maybe even die. And Jesus, finally, if you read the Gospels, like in Matthew 23, he gets so frustrated with this kind of theology, this idea of for that following God is about rules and regulations and redemptive violence, that in Matthew 23, he just lets loose on the Pharisees. He calls them whitewashed tombs. He says, you're like a cup that's filthy on the inside, and you just clean the outside. He says, you're like a, 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 a guide, but you're a blind guide. And then he says this. He said, you're like snakes, and he calls them snakes. And then for some reason, I, I can't figure it out, they wanted to kill him, you know? <laughs> I don't know why. They really didn't like what he had to say. But then Jesus comes along and he says, redemption is about love. And he brings and he shows us what redemptive love is all about. Some people say that love is God's signature. And that's the verse that Matthew Richardson read a few, a few minutes ago, that God so loved the world that he sends his son that whoever believes has eternal life. That verse is for you because of the love of God. That's redemptive love. 
Have you, I think you all, all of us, if you've been in church for any length of time, you know a Christian who's an extremist, right? Do, we, do you know some? You don't have to raise your hand. Keep your hands down. But do you know some Christians who are extremists? Most Christian extremists are angry about something. Uh, the challenge today is to be extremists for love. I have this quote years ago, Dr. Martin Luther King said this, and it's still true for all of us today. We, these are extreme times. The question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists will we be? Will we be extremists for hate, or, we will, or will we be extremists for love? Uh, today, I hope you can start to be an extremist for love. So do you see where I'm going? That Jesus comes and he brings grace and love to us. And then his invitation to all of us is to become peace, persons of grace and love to others, agents who do that. But in order for us to be agents of grace and love, we are first going to have to drop our stones. And if you've been carrying around any kind of stone in your hand, you're going to have to drop it. So here's what we read in verse 8. Go back in, in, in the passage with me. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until there was no one left. And the woman was just standing there. And Jesus said, is there no one here to condemn you? And she says, no one, sir. And he says, neither do I. So one by one, these stone throwers start to drop their rocks. We, and we read here, it was the oldest ones, the wisest ones. They right away see what Jesus is saying. He's, Jesus is saying, hey, I'm a sinner like her. Uh, what right do I have to judge her? And the wise ones drop their stones. Maybe they see her humanity. Maybe the oldest one has a, a daughter about her age. And, and they see that, that she is a person. Sometimes they say... That the, when we are enraged or angry with someone, all we see is the offense, and we stop seeing them as a person. And maybe that needs to happen in your life. What does it mean to drop your stone? I, I think dropping our stones means that you forgive someone. Like Jesus on the cross, we'll look at it in a, in a couple of weeks. He's on the cross, and he says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they are doing. Do you know who the they is? The they is the Pharisees and the Sadducees who had him whipped and beaten and spit on him. My question is, how saturated does your life need to be in love in order for you to forgive your enemies who spit on you? But that's what Jesus says. Uh, and as you think of people in your life who you need to forgive, I'm sure you can think of a hundred reasons, good reasons, why you should not forgive them. They deserve it. But the problem is, if you don't forgive them, you will always be chained to that offense. You will carry this, uh, this unforgiveness around in your soul that's as heavy as this rock. Any of you as a kid ever try to tell yourself, I'm never speaking to my mother again or my father? Anyway, was that just me? Any of you ever do that? All right. They didn't buy me the Lego set when we were at Target. I'm never speaking to her again. Am I the only one that tried this? All right. You last till dinner time, all right? And, and, and you're, you're, Mom, I need some food. All right, then, then it's all over. But do you know what I realized even as a kid? It took a lot of effort to remind myself that I was mad at my parents, okay? Because I kept forgetting I'm supposed to be mad at them. But you can go through life like that. Dropping your stones for you, it might mean forgiving someone. Dropping your stone might mean reconciling with someone. Maybe it's been 60 years since you spoke to your brother. Maybe it's been 60 months or 60 weeks or 60 days, but it's time to reconcile. It's time to, to invite that person back if you know that they need to be forgiven and you've been holding this grudge against them. I think dropping our stone means that we live simply as more gracious people. That's one of my invitations today. Do you know some people, have you, do you, you know their names, don't say them out loud, but are there some people in your workplace, they show up every Monday ready to throw a rock at somebody? <laughs> do you know those people? Every meeting, they're ready to throw a stone at someone. Or do you have people in your neighborhood that are constantly throwing stones? Do you have a family member, a relative? Hopefully you only see them once a year at Thanksgiving, but there are some relatives that are always ready to throw a stone. And our tendency is to throw it back. And I want to say, no, flip the script on that. When you walk into your, your place of work tomorrow morning, become a person of grace. 
Uh, let graciousness spill out in every conversation. Fill your meetings with grace. Fill your home. When you walk into your home, uh, start there. Fill that with grace. May the grace of God fill your life so it spills over into the places where you spend your time. If you have been carrying around a backpack full of rocks like this, then my invitation today is to drop them, one at a time. And I don't know what stone you hold in your hand. Maybe your stone says anger, then drop that. Maybe your stone says bitterness, drop that. Maybe your, your stone says condemn, and you've been condemning someone, and it's time to get rid of that. Maybe your stone says envy, or it says Gossip. You've been saying things behind someone's back. You know it's not true. Maybe your stone says uh, racism or prejudice. You have to drop that. Maybe you've been wanting to throw a stone at an entire segment of our population. Maybe it says unforgiveness, and you've been holding on to that. Or your stone says rage. Or it says revenge. You can't wait to get back. You've been waiting for years to get even. Or it says hate. The human soul doesn't do good when it holds on to hate or anger. This backpack, it's like feather light now. And maybe your life has felt so heavy, heavy as it was. And and Jesus says, leave that with me. Take on my load. It's extremely light. And fill your life with the joy again that comes from knowing Jesus Christ.